you're home, you're bored, and you need a gaming PC that can entertain you no matter what room of the house you're in. And hopefully, when we're allowed to leave our homes at some point in the future, then you want this PC to be able to beam fun anywhere over the internet to where you are. Now witness the frame rates of this fully programmed and operational gaming station. If all you need in your home theater PC is just to watch Netflix, then you'll get by with just a Chromecast. If all you need is a box so that you can stream your Steam games from your work PC over to your TV, then get yourself a $20 Steam Link. But this computer is going to be the 24-7 fun server for the whole family. And because it's what's on the inside that counts, let's take a look at the insides of this computer. To accomplish all of these computing needs, I was originally going to use a Ryzen 1800X, but unfortunately, because of the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, my sister needed to start working from home, so I gave her the 1800X, and I got the slower processor, the i7-6800K. But one perk is that that brings me up to the X99 platform, which has a lot of potential. For instance, this motherboard has 10 SATA ports and enough PCIe slots that I can add a lot more, making this the perfect candidate to become a storage box in the future if that's something I need. We've also got 24 gigs of DDR4 at 2800 megahertz running in quad channel, a boot SSD, an ancient 750 gig hard drive, and also, interestingly enough, a 128 gig USB 3 drive that's wired up internally off of the second set of USB 3 headers. For graphics, we've got the RX 590 Fat Boy, which was chosen entirely for its meme name, and also because it was on sale, and given that everything we're going to be playing off of this box is at 60 FPS, that's enough to do that. We're not going to need a faster video card unless maybe we want to do ray traced 4K at some point in the future. But as of right now, the 720p projector and the 1440p screen that I'll occasionally stream to are going to be just fine at 60 FPS, especially considering that the newest game I play, with any regularity, is 3 years old. The 6800K is plenty good for anything I need, but we overclocked it anyway. 4 GHz is what we were able to get out of here, and once we kind of hit that wall, we started dropping voltage down to 1 volt on the dot, amazingly enough. That's pretty good. And heat-wise, it is actually pretty good too. It stays under 60 degrees Celsius. And because we've got low power draw, that means the room that this computer is in won't get as hot. Although, having the projector in there with a 300 watt bulb kind of defeats that purpose, but you gotta make compromises somewhere. If you're the only PC gamer at home, or everyone can actually agree on one game to play together, then six cores is going to be just fine. But everything was not just fine. Well, that seemed a little ominous. For homes with multiple gamers who can't agree on what game to play, you're gonna need more than six cores, so that you can set up a two gamers, one CPU, or in this case, a three gamers, one CPU type scenario. So we have a 12-core Xeon processor in here, the E52673 V3 to be specific, because I know that was exactly what was on your mind. And the best part is, I sold the 6-core processor for twice as much as I then spent on the 12-core. So I made money doubling the number of cores. So what's the trade-off? Quite a few trade-offs, actually. So. 4 GHz overclocked on that 6800K, down to 2.4 base, 3.1 boost. And unfortunately, X99 and Xeon compatibility is somewhat hit or miss. This computer refused to boot 
in quad channel. And even if I just left one dim of memory in either of the first two channels, it's a quad channel board, it would not boot. So I've got 24 gigs of DDR4 still in here, but it's just running in dual channel. So that stinks. And any clock speed settings I specify on this motherboard do not apply to this processor. Fortunately, the all-core boost is 2.7, so we're at least 10% above base clock. And I dropped the voltage again on here. I was able to do that. So at least we're not going to be hitting the power limit. And while the clock speeds aren't anything special to write home about, having double the cores is. Because whenever I'm actually working, I do work and not just play video games from time to time. On this machine, I can be editing, and then whenever I'm ready to export the project, instead of maxing out this machine for an hour, send that over to this machine so that it's busy for an hour in the living room, and I'm free to get an extra hour of productivity, or play some Need for Speed Payback for an hour. Now, if you were building this from scratch, you should absolutely not go with an X99 build in this day and age. The motherboard is going to cost you 250 bucks, which is more than you could get a 3600X for, and the Xeon here was another 100, and you can get a decent motherboard for 100 on AM4. So $400 over here versus 250 is what I spent for all this back in the day. It doesn't really add up, especially when you look at Cinebench scores and realize that the Ryzen 3600X with half the cores is faster. But I already had the X99 motherboard, so I thought it would be fun. I can already hear several people typing in the chat, so make sure to leave those comments down in the substantiated fanboy opinion section down below. But the software is what turns this really expensive nightlight into something actually useful. Every home theater PC needs to do at least two basic things. Play movies and play games. A good home theater PC will do both of those to the display it's attached to. A better home theater PC will do both of those things to any display in your home. And the best home theater PC will do that as your own personal cloud. Think of it this way. For building this machine, you now have your own GeForce Now or Google Stadia, and you don't have to pay any subscription fees. Movie watching on the attached projector is easy enough. Install VLC Media Player and you're basically good to go. Now you too can enjoy your crisp 4K 60 HDR Blu-rays on a 720p projector, projecting onto off-white textured drywall. Hey, I'm from Texas, where bigger is better, and I got a 16-foot screen. That's all that matters. To help with the audio, we've installed Breakaway Audio Enhancer. It's an amazing tool, and you can choose what you want to get out of it. I personally listen to the regulator if I'm doing music on this machine, but if I want to boost the vocals, then I can apply the easy listening profile, turn the bass up or down depending on what I want and who I'm listening with, and you can also normalize the audio in real time. So that way, whenever there's a quiet scene and a loud scene, you don't have to frantically fish for the remote before the speakers blow themselves a new hole in the wall. And then for any movie I want to beam off of my collection from one of the hard drives in here, that's where Resilio Sync comes in. So that on my actual HDR display phone, I can enjoy those movies with the crisp visual fidelity they were actually meant to have and I can stream those files either over the network at full gigabit speeds, or if I'm taking a tablet on the go, I can quickly download a list of movies off of here, store them on the tablet wirelessly while I'm grabbing my wallet or keys, pick up the tablet, and leave. So, any movie on any device, thanks to this puppy. As for gaming, you'd think if I have a 720p projector, I could have just as easily gone with a Ryzen 2400G and literally used the integrated graphics to get 720p60. And well, you're not wrong, but because this is streaming the gameplay to other computers in the home and over the internet, that's why we needed the RX 590, or insert higher powered graphics card here. My workstation, of course, 
processes its own games locally. But if I want to play Rocket League on my phone because I'm too lazy to get out of bed in the morning, that's where this comes in. Or if I want to play Sid Meier's Civilization 4, but because I have Linux on my laptop, it can't do it, I can use Steam's in-home streaming to beam that over the network. And whenever I leave the home, that's where you can download Parsec, which is free. There's also a paid tier, but hey, there's a free one. Now, if you are playing games on your phone, you're not going to want to use the touch controls on the screen. You're going to want some kind of controller for it with physical buttons. And there do be some controllers on Amazon that turn your phone into a Nintendo Switch if you're into that form factor. Personally, I really love the Xbox controller, so I have 3D printed this little doodad, which clips your phone onto the Xbox 360 controller. There are finished products on eBay that for five bucks do this exact sort of thing, but you will also need to drill a hole so that you can access the sync button on the controller. They covered that up. But why would I wait two to three days for shipping when I can just wait two to three hours and 3D print it myself? Overall, the quality is great. The actual streaming data rate between my phone and the HTPC is about 100 megs a second many times more than what Twitch or YouTube will use for their online game streams. The quality on a tiny phone screen is fantastic, far better than what your phone is going to render natively. However, I do run into a bandwidth problem if I'm using my laptop that tops out at 3 megabytes a second. The quality tanks, although the latency is good enough I can still play in verses and not notice the lag. Everything you're seeing in gameplay mind you, has been compressed from this box to my phone that you've been watching. My phone then capture, compress, and then in editing it has been decompressed and recompressed for exporting and then uploaded to library. But if you're watching on YouTube, then YouTube has compressed it yet again. So the fact that you can see any gameplay footage during this last little bit is frankly amazing given how much recompression has been done to that poor video file. But just know, it was only compressed 25% as much and at a much higher bit rate, which is good for quality, when I was seeing it on my phone. So what you see on screen is far worse than what I saw on screen. And as for quality between using Steam or Parsec within the home, I didn't notice too much of a quality difference. I think Parsec might have actually been a little bit clearer and the latency was certainly perfect on both, so either way, it's a good way to go. The advantage with Parsec, if you're streaming in-home, is that it opens you up to your Origin or your Uplay libraries, so you don't have to rely on Steam's in-home streaming for that. I had mentioned that there are two non-boot storage devices in this machine. The 750 gig hard drive is for couch multiplayer games or games that are frequently updated. This way, I'm not relying on my network storage for all of my Steam library. If there's a LAN party, I have some games on here where I can just pick up the machine, take it and go. And then the USB drive is for games under two gigabytes or that are no longer updated so that I still have fast read speeds and I'm not bottlenecked by the impossibly slow write speeds of my USB drive. In this case, the 275R Airflow Edition, it's actually just tucked in here behind that bottom fan. And assuming that your volatile memory is also good, your RAM, then you have the possibility of running your own game servers on this machine. So the family Minecraft server is on this machine now, in addition to streaming any game whenever I need it. And thanks to all those cores that a game can't take advantage of, and that extra memory, there's no performance penalty for also running a Minecraft server while playing a game at the same time. I love my workstation the most, but I feel right now as though I am proudest of this machine here, the HTPC, because of how much more this machine enables me to do. The role of my workstation is basically to not get in the way of the creative process or, you know, jobs that actually pay the bills around here. Two and a half thousand subscribers, I love you guys, but that don't pay the bills like 3D printing and other stuff that this does. But whenever I need the extra computational power, 
and I can't afford to be waiting on render times, this machine saves the day. And whenever I need to play a game on the couch because I'm too lazy, this enables me to be extra lazy and work extra hard. Plus, you gotta love having that desktop class performance on any device in the house. Now that I have my terabytes of networked game storage and my terabytes of movie collection available thanks to this machine on every device I own with minimal latency, I am confident in declaring this the ultimate home theater PC setup. Now, you could absolutely go crazy with like a 32 or a 64 core Threadripper in your machine, and yes, that would be more ultimate than this. But functionally, it wouldn't do any more for me if I had that. I am not limited by the hardware, though dated, in this box. Once I upgrade my projector to be like a 4K laser model, then the actual home theater will be up to the same level as the home theater PC. But until then, I'm just going to have to make do with using my phone or whatever. But until then, I'll have to make do with what I got. Plus, I don't wear my glasses when I watch a movie, so I can't tell the difference, even if the pixels are enormous. I've already got a couple more Ultimate Tech House videos filmed and mostly edited. They'll be coming up over the next couple of months once I get them finished. And you can look forward to catching those videos if you're subscribed. Until then, though, let me know in the comments. What does your home theater PC do? What should mine do? What, what did I miss? And what are some other ultimate tech setups for your house that I should be incorporating into my home? Let me know down below. In the meantime, download a computer case off my website, 3dpc.xyz, and I'll see you in the next one.